Hi, Alex. Hi, Bob. Thanks How you for doing? Being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. You certainly deserve it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and via audio uh, podcast. You are Alexander Went. Is that a fair pronunciation of your last name? Went? Yes, and you can just call me Alex. I go by Alex. I, 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 will, I will call you Alex. You're the Ralph D. Mershon Professor of International Security at Ohio State University. We're going to talk about uh, a fascinating book you've written, very ambitious and cosmic, called Quantum Mind and Social Science. Uh, I want to say first, though, something about your previous book by way of setting this up, because for one thing, there's such a stark um, contrast, seemingly, between the two books. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, the, you know, the book we're going to talk about will get us into all these cosmic things, consciousness, free will, uh, various other things. Um, but your, your previous book, or at least your previous kind of big book that you're known for, was called Social Theory of International Politics. Uh, there won a lot of accolades. According to Wikipedia, it was the winner of the International Studies Association Best Book of the Decade Award for 1991-2000. As long as we're on the subject of uh, laudatory things Wikipedia relays about you. It says that a 2011 survey of international relations scholars worldwide ranked you first in terms of having, quote, produced the best work in the field of IR, international relations, that is, in the past 20 years. There's another, another such accolade, but I'll, I'll stop there because my point is just that, you know, you were proceeding along a fairly conventional path for an international relations scholar. You wrote the kind of book that one would expect such a scholar to write called The Social Theory of International Politics. And although I'm sure not everyone agreed with the book, because part of the idea of the book was you were taking on some of the kind of giants in the field. Yeah. Uh, still, it was recognized as a very significant work within your field. And then you go and decide to devote a lot of time to studying, uh, you know, quantum physics and the, and the underlying philosophy, uh, and write a book called Quantum Mind and Social Science with the subtitle Unifying Physical and Social Ontology. I think most people would call that a gamble, <laughs> career-wise, right? Yes, yes. So why did you do this? Um, well, partly I had said everything I wanted to say in the first book, and it took a long time to write. It was a long book. Um, I was a little bit bored of saying what I was saying, and I knew basically all the problems of the book before it even came out. I knew the kinds of critiques it would get. Um, the debates that it was engaging in are endless. Um, and so I was looking around, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my career defending something I'd written in my 30s. Um, that was really the driver. I wanted to you know, just a Monty Python moment and do now for something completely different, basically. Um, I, think I, just, yeah. I think you've succeeded in creating the Monty Python. <laughs> yes, I, I hope so. And, um, but it was also just a chance encounter with this one book called Qu Quantum Society, which I read, uh, which put the idea in my head. So it was kind of a random event as much as anything. But I was, I was intellectually kind of restless and wanting to do something different. Um, and I've always had philosophical interests. And so it seemed like a natural move. Okay. But it is risky. And, and just to, to cut to the chase a little, how has the risk paid off? I mean, it's been out for several years now. And uh, I would predict that the average international relations scholar would still be scratching his or her head just based on the subject, not because, and we should say, you know, it's put out by, it's published by Cambridge University Press. This is a, you know, so it's being taken seriously in all of these respects. I would say, there, not every speculative book about quantum physics would would Cambridge have agreed to publish, right? So it 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 has, um, you know that that kind of validation. But but what has the reception uh, been like? Well, it's been slower than I would like. Um, that's probably natural. And actually, within my own field of IR, most people I don't think have read the book. It's just too far afield for them. Um, but I do get a lot of email especially from grad students and undergraduates even, young faculty, young people who mm -hmm. have found the book somehow, and they just send me email out of the blue about how much they love it or whatever. So there's an undercurrent, um, slow-moving undercurrent of people who really appreciate the book. Um, 
it's been reviewed not as much as I wanted, but it has been reviewed quite well, actually, in most cases, even by physicists, surprisingly. Um, and I was told up front by Cambridge that this is the kind of book that would take at least five years to sink in before people would really start to chew on it. And so this is year four. Um, so <laughs> getting a little any, bit impatient. Any now. Yeah, any moment now, right, exactly. But, you know, I think I've been satisfied and trying to create a pipeline of students who want to do this kind of work now and thinking about what to do next along these lines. So it's something that took 10 years to write, probably take 10 more years or 10 years to, to filter out. Um, so, and I'm a patient guy, so. Okay. So it seems like, you know, you could start this conversation in a lot of places. It seems like one thing to say is that the conventional view about the relationship of quantum physics to kind of the functioning of a human body, including human psychology, is that yes, if you look deep down, you know, deeply, deep down enough into the constituents of the human body, you would find some subatomic particles that, that demonstrate quantum effects, but it kind of all washes out, or the, or, or the quantum effects, and, and, and yes, quantum effects are super weird, and we still don't know what to make of them, but it doesn't matter for these purposes because they kind of cancel each other out in some sense so that in the end, the way the human body and the human brain function is exactly the way they would function even if it, it, their most fundamental constituents were just classical particles behaving in non-weird fashion. So in other words, the conventional view with which you take issue, I gather, is that quantum physics just doesn't really matter for purposes of analyzing human behavior, which is what social scientists like you do. Is that right? That's, that's absolutely right. And hardly any social scientists um, do quantum social science. Although ironically in 1927, the president of the American Political Science Association, right after the quantum revolution in his presidential address to political scientists said, we need to engage quantum theory. But then for the next 90 years, nobody did. So, um, so that is the conventional wisdom. And I think it's just fundamentally wrong, but you know, I, this is a very speculative book. So um, I don't know. I, I do know that this is the first time I've written something that's either right or wrong. Um, usually in social science, we don't do that kind of work. It's you know partly right and partly wrong. This is either completely wrong or there's something really interesting that's right there. So now, now is that because usually what you're really saying when you put forth a theory is this is I think this is a fruitful way to look at the world. I think there will be benefits to looking at the world through this particular prism, which isn't quite the same as saying this is a, an accurate description of the way the world is. I mean, it, it, is that is that the reason you're normally not in the business of making truth claims or? Um, I think it's just that social science is so messy and the data are so poor um, that all the claims we make are probabilistic and partly true and partly not true. And there are millions of exceptions and there's nothing that seems really firm and solid. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to say that, you know, any claim that I made in my first book is true in some big T true sense it's plausible and people can argue about it, but um, most social scientists don't use the language of truth and falsity very much. Right. And I don't really either. I just think this book actually happens to be either true or false. Sort of because it's a claim about the actual fundamental nature of reality right. and, and it's the, the relationship of that to us. So, you know, let's, um, so one, one thing you say is, uh, by way of describing a claim the book makes, is that we are walking wave functions. Now, that's another way of saying kind of what I just said, which is that uh, the nature of quantum reality is, in fact, manifest at the level of actual human thought and behavior. But, but, but maybe we should say more about what, what the nature of that quantum reality is. It would talk about the significance of the wave function in, in quantum physics, what it means at the level of, of, of particles, for starters, before we even get into human behavior. Well, I'm not a physicist, obviously, and, um, and there's a lot of debate, I know, among philosophers of physics about what is the wave function, and is it real, or is it just a description that's not referring to anything real? Um, but it's, it's designed, I think, to describe all the possible things we might observe if we observe the system in question. Um, and we won't know what actually happens, of course, until it, we actually try to observe it. 
um, but the wave function gives us the probabilities of observing a particle hitting in one place versus someplace else on the screen. And that's right. all it gives us is the probabilities. Basically. Right. And there are different interpretations of quantum physics, but it, but it seems like one, um, one thing most agree on is that if you ask the question, well, okay, where was the electron before we measured it? There is no one answer. Right. I mean, the, the, now thereafter interpretations might differ. Some people would say it's nowhere. Some people might say it's actually in multiple locations. Some people would say, just think of it as a probability distribution. But there seems to be, you know, quantum physicists tell us there's good reason to believe that the thing we would intuitively expect, which is that the electron was in one place. We just didn't know where it was before we measured it. That is wrong. At the subatomic level, you start getting weird things like this, where particles aren't really particles in the sense that we think, right? That, that is pretty commonly agreed on. Now, thereafter, interpretations differ. Is, right. there a, is there an interpretation that you associate yourself with? I mean, for example, there's the many worlds interpretation, where actually multiple different worlds are being created, and one, the electron's here, and the other, the electron is there. That's an example of a weird interpretation. Is there an interpretation you most associate yourself with? Well, I guess, um, I think so. I'm not sure it's a single interpretation. It would be a family of interpretations. Um, I sort of think about interpretations of quantum theory as those that are basically materialist interpretations where consciousness plays no role at all. And then there are ones in which consciousness somehow figures centrally. Um, and so I'm in the latter group. I think most physicists and interpreters of, of physics, quantum theory are materialists. Um, and they just assume that consciousness somehow comes up later on at a more macroscopic level. And so there's no need to bring it into physics itself. Um, and I would go with a, var there are a variety of panpsychist, so-called panpsychist interpretations, uh, where consciousness is built into the quantum all the way down, so to speak. Um, and those are the family of interpretations that I'm aligning with. Um, and they used to be a minority, but they're getting a lot more attraction in the past five or 10 years. I'm seeing a lot more interest in that, both among the quantum people and among philosophers of mind, so. Right, so yeah, panpsychism, I mean, not, you know, the idea that, that subjective experience is actually, to some extent, inherent in physical matter itself, not just living beings. Right. That, that is getting more airtime among philosophers. Not all of them would connect it to quantum physics, but I guess the connection to quantum physics is, you know, if you ask, well, why did the electron finally wind up here when we measured it, as opposed to there, if it could have been either place, surprisingly, physicists don't have an answer, right? In fact, the, the, in fact it, it's, it, most of them would say, there is no cause in the physical universe for, for where it winds up. We can right. predict that it will, become so, it will be somewhere definite when you measure it, and the measurement will, in some sense, bring it into definite existence. Something about the measurement, whether it's the, the conscious observer or, or the physical measure, just encountering the physical measuring device, but we, we, there is no... We certainly don't know, and we think there just is no answer to the question of what in the physical universe makes it do what it does. And as you note, um, you know, some physicists like Freeman Dyson have said the way to think of it is that mind is embedded uh, mm -hmm. in physical matter. The, the, the electron is deciding. It, it, it's it's right. making the decision. And, and, and so I guess the connection you see between quantum physics and panpsychism is that that is a that's the way to describe it because and and to think of the electron as conscious or something down there is right is that right yeah i mean i have to be careful about using the word conscious and, and electrons in the same sense i'm not sure that you know some people talk about proto consciousness or something like that but but that is basically my view and and what i what i find so attractive in quantum theory is that there's actually a space there in the collapse of the wave function for consciousness to sort of fit into the model, basically. Um, whereas in the classical worldview, there's no place at all for consciousness, and that's why we're completely stuck. So, um, you know, my own feeling about the mind-body problem in consciousness these days is that if your approach to consciousness is not crazy, then it's not serious. All the serious ones that are in play now, I think, have got to be pretty crazy. And so a lot of the materialist arguments, I think, are kind of old hat and 
let's move, we've done that, let's move on, so to speak. So an example of a materialist argument, I, I mean, that you include by that the, the, the arguments that are almost saying the consciousness doesn't exist, right? They're saying right. it just is the physical stuff. And my own view has been that people who say that don't really understand the problem, which is probably your view. Yes, very much so, yeah. Like, it is amazing that it is like something to be alive and we have no explanation, is my yes. view. Okay, we agree. Totally agree, yeah. And, and actually, I think that people that deny this, they're, the only reason they're denying it is to save their materialist commitments. And so you're throwing away your, your, what you're trying to explain and saying it's an illusion in order to save your theory. And that's just bad science or bad reasoning, I think. So, um, but, you know, again, this is it's, it's all very speculative. So okay. now we will get to some ways in which you see this all is relevant to like human psychology and social science and everything. But we can stay at this philosophical level. Was this one of your main sources of interest in the subject? The fact that you considered consciousness an unsolved problem and this seemed to offer a path? Um, yeah, and it was a lingering issue from my first book, um, What to Do with Subjectivity, which is how social scientists would normally talk about consciousness. Um, I didn't, couldn't figure out what to do with it, so I did what everybody else did with it, which was kind of just smush it in there somehow and, and hope for the best. So there was a lingering thought in the back of my mind that there's a problem here. And then reading this Zohar book on quantum society kind of began to put the pieces together. Um, and then I just started reading more, and the more stuff I read, the more it just all cohered. And in a way, I see the book as kind of, I collected all the marginal thoughts that are out there and put them all in one place. And they all cohere very nicely when you put them all together, so. Right, so your view is that actually this solves, part of the appeal is that you think this solves a lot of problems, not just conscious, and I don't mean solve definitively, but it offers right. possible solutions to a lot of different problems. Yes, and it's and I should emphasize this is not my view. What I've done is really, I'm kind of a gatherer. I've kind of collected all this these arguments that other people have made, and then I've tried to put them together in a social science friendly way. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, for example, there are theories of quantum consciousness. I had on the show some time ago Stuart Hameroff, who has mm -hmm. along with Roger Penrose mm -hmm. one version of that. I mean, I should say I don't understand exactly how it, 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 it's still. I mean, consciousness is inherently hard to conceptualize. It's just inherently hard to conceptualize its relationship to the physical world. But but their idea, I think, Hameroff and Penrose, is that uh, the, I mean, it's it's funny because we were referring to the measurement issue where some people would say that when uh, you measure an electron, what is forcing the wave to collapse into a definite uh, answer as to where the electron is, is consciousness observing the process but as I understand their theory, it's more like the consciousness is the collapse of the wave. The wave, the collapse of the wave function creates consciousness more than the other way around. Right. That's right. And that's your view. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how committed I am to the Hameroff Penrose argument in particular. There are a variety of, there are quite a few now variants, or maybe they're not even variants, different kinds of quantum consciousness arguments. Um, but the bottom line of them all is the same. Um, and it is the case, my view is, that um, consciousness is actually, when the wave function collapses, it's half of what emerges, and the other half of what emerges is a particle. So there's like a, a what is it, a symmetry breaking, and that's when, so consciousness is not causing the collapse, consciousness either is part of the collapse, or it's a manifestation of the collapse, or something like that. Right. I mean, this... Um... This is uh, another another problem that you think this is relevant to is free will. Mm -hmm. And and how would you state the relevance you see and how this view colors your view of the free will question? Well, I think most people who've thought about quantum theory and free will think that they, there's just no way to put them together because quantum theory is supposedly about random stuff and free will can't be random. Um, it has to be purposive. So... Um, so I'm running against the grain here. On the other hand, if you're thinking about physical representations of the world and where would free will fit, collapse of the wave function seems like the perfect spot uh, where that would happen. Um, I don't think, and a lot of people, I mean, I think free will is just as much of a mystery as consciousness is. And we have a lot of, you know, mainstream philosophers now telling us that free will also is an illusion. So 
again, throwing mm -hmm. out your what you're trying to explain in order to save your theory. Um, but yeah, so I think the free will, I think, is all part of this same package, basically. Yeah. Although I can at least imagine free will being an illusion. I mean, I, I'm agnostic on free will, whereas consciousness, I think if you think that's an illusion, you don't understand what you literally don't understand what we're talking about. Right. By definition, consciousness is the fact that it is like something to be you. And no, none of these people, Dan Dennett doesn't deny that it's like something to be him. But anyway, I, I digress. The, um, but one question about free will is, I mean, would this be a version of free will that ultimately does feel any more empowering? What I mean by that is if, if consciousness is created by all the particles making up their minds and that free will emerges in the same process, then in a certain sense, the actual agents are all the particles and I am just a medium for right. the, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, the way I would see it is that all the particles that make up each individual human or every organism create a single giant particle, a co quantum coherent system, um, and that system then makes decisions for itself freely as a whole. And this would yeah. apply to all organisms and, and not just people. Um, so ultimately, you do have the constituent parts, but one of the nice things or cool things about quantum theory is that if you have quantum coherence, then all the particles, in a sense, become one, in a sense, or become, they all operate the same way, or all are on the same page or wavelength, so to speak. No. Um, so, it's now, is that by virtue of entanglement, or this is something else? It's, it's an entanglement. It's a kind of entanglement. It's a special kind of entanglement, as I, as I understand it. So, maybe we should say a couple of things. First of all, we should say that coherence, as opposed to decoherence, alludes to that question of whether the quantum effects kind of wash out before yes. they get to the level of significance so far as human behavior is concerned. The conventional thinking is that there is decoherence, right? Which means that the effects uh, cease to be, I guess, maybe meaningfully correlated, but, but they cease to be meaningful. Um, the, uh, what, oh, what else was I going to say? Um, well, let's, is there anything else you want to say about free will? I, I mean, I guess I was going to say, to 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 pursue the thought I had I expressed a little further. It's almost I almost imagine that what's going on in your view is like the universe is making up its mind. The, the universe is exercising volition, and we are manifestations of that. Is kind of what I was saying, but that's not exactly. You, you still see, an important thing for you is that you see individual human beings as agents. Is that right? Yes, every organism it would be a, a separate agent. Now, these agents are all entangled in different kinds of ways. Um, so we're not agents in the traditional Hobbesian, you know, totally separate physical sense, in the old-fashioned sense, the materialist sense. Um, but yes, everybody's an agent. Everybody's making decisions freely, conditioned on the context in which they're operating. Um, and it's all about sustaining quantum coherence. And... The moment you die is when you stop having quantum coherence and you're just, you just decohere for one last time, basically. Um, and, and you said quantum coherence is related to entanglement, so we should tell people quickly that entanglement refers to this weird property where apparently one particle can influence a distant particle instantaneously. In other words, the influence can spread, uh, can move faster than the speed of light. That's not not everyone would want to say that the particles can communicate faster than the speed right. of light. And right. certainly we humans cannot use this fact. We cannot harness it to communicate faster than the speed of light so far as we can figure out, but still it's an instantaneous kind of influence. And you think this is where it could get weird, right? Because it could be that, that, uh, I'm being instantaneously influenced by, I don't think you get into this kind of stuff in the book, but it's consistent with the theory that I could be instantaneously influenced by something happening in the mind of another human far, far away. Yeah, there would have to be some kind of medium. And for me, that's language. Um, and language has all kinds of roles in the argument. And we can talk about that if you want. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it is an instantaneous um, correlation, I guess, is the way to, it's correlation without causation in, in this, you know, I mean, normally you think correlation without causation is 
therefore uninteresting. In this case, there cannot be any causation that explains this outcome. All you have is the correlation, which by itself is then very mysterious. Now, although there's almost, isn't there a kind of causation in the sense that like, if I, what, what initiates the influence is like, I observe a particle here that could either be heads or tails, so to speak. And there, the, the laws of physics say that if it's heads, it's twin particle has to be tails. If it's tails, it's twin particle has to be heads. So when I measure it and it assumes definite shape and it's heads, that does mean that the other one is going to be tails, but you're saying that that's not the same as that causing the other one to be tails. Well, it would be, I mean, non-local causation is the term that a lot of people use. And um, it's just not causation in the traditional materialist, right. mechanical, you know, exchange of energy and force or whatever it is kind of model of causation. Right. So, uh, but clearly, yes, I think the choice over here is influencing what happens over here non-local however you want it, but whatever verb you want to use to describe that. Okay. So why don't we, you mentioned language, why don't we uh, move to some of the implications you see for thinking about human behavior, social behavior, and everything, and let's... Um, well, can I suggest one other question sure. before? Mm -hmm. I wonder if we should briefly talk about what the rationale, or what, why we, one might think that these quantum effects scale up to the human level. Why, why you might think the conventional wisdom is wrong right? And, and, and decoherence is not complete. Yeah, I mean, I have a quick answer on that. And that for me, that's a key, a key step in the whole story. Okay. Um, the quick answer, it's really threefold, was the quantum consciousness arguments, which have been around for a while, but are very controversial and, and we don't have a lot of evidence. Um, secondly is uh, the rise of quantum biology, and we're now finding quantum effects in all kinds of animals and trees and plants and so on, which 30 years ago, people were emphatic in saying, no way can this happen. And now we're seeing evidence of this. Is there an example of a kind of a quantum effect? And what would that be like to see a quantum effect in, in like an animal? Uh, well, I know that in the case of plants, photosynthesis now is understood in, by many in quantum terms. Um, I know that birds... There, there's a research on birds and, and their magnetic compass is somehow quantumly connected to the magnetic field of the planet or something. Um, so there are, and I think there are a variety of organisms now where they're finding ways in which these organisms exploit quantum connections to their environment. Mm -hmm. And my assumption is that if a tree or a bird has the capability to exploit quantum connections to their environment, then human beings will certainly have that because we're obviously more advanced than they are, and we wouldn't lose that ability. But right, and the, and the conventional claim had been that, that the nature of the human brain, it's like wet and whatever, precluded quantum effects seeping through that. And, and you're saying the fact that we observe this in similar biological systems cast doubt on that claim. It casts some doubt. I mean, I don't know how far um, one can, I don't know how far the quantum biologists themselves are willing to push their argument probably not as far as I would want to. Um, but I think that the fact that we are seeing certain kinds of quantum effects in organisms that people were saying could not happen, and now we have a lot of evidence of that, um, does cast doubt on the conventional wisdom. But the most crucial piece of evidence for the scaling up, I think, is what the mathematical psychologists have found who have quantized um, expected utility theory and economic theory and stuff, and finding that by doing that, you can explain all kinds of behavioral anomalies in human choice behavior. Okay, so that's the third reason you that's think... The uh, that's the decisive one. That's the one that really gets social scientists' attention. Okay, let's focus on that, because I'm not, I'm not sure I'm persuaded, but uh, that, that would not itself necessarily be very meaningful. But, um, but, but you, so you talk about some of these findings that people are not entirely rational uh, by by kind of at least intuitively in, in the way they exercise intuition, these are, the findings are associated with with Danny Kahneman and and his his collaborator Tversky. He wrote Kahneman wrote a, a best selling book called What Thinking Fast and Slow mm -hmm. uh, about this. Now I, I don't I don't see why you can't explain human irrationality in kind of classical terms. And I can explain what I mean by that. But first, why don't you elaborate on how you are seeing, apparently there's this thing called quantum decision 
theory or something that I didn't even know about. And you're saying that that can explain these seemingly irrational inclinations of people very elegantly. So why don't you talk about that? What is quantum decision theory? What are some of the findings it seems to account for? Well, quantum decision theory is just the same as classical decision theory um, or a rational choice in, in social science jargon. Um, only what's happened is um, the analyst has substituted classical axioms for quantum axioms or vice versa, whatever. So now you're putting quantum axioms, the axioms in there, and that changes the predictions of the theory subtly uh, in subtle ways, but it does change the predictions. And what the psychologists had all found experimentally is that, you know, there are a lot of ways in which human, the human mind and behavior deviates from the classical model of rationality, um, again, in subtle ways, but systematically deviates um, in, in large experimental studies. And when you use the classical model as the normative baseline, so if that's the baseline, then there's a lot of irrationality out there and a lot of stuff people are doing and saying that they shouldn't be thinking or doing. Um, if you switch the baseline to a quantum decision theory baseline, then suddenly all these effects appear as predicted. They're predicted by the quantum decision theory framework. So, um, and the, the people who do this stuff, you know, have done a lot of hard work showing that the behavioral data match the predictions more or less of the theory. Now, does that mean that the theory explains the data? I don't know. That's a further question, which I'm not sure how to think about. Um, but there's still, it's a very striking match. And it's one, and what to me is very powerful is that it's a single theory, quantum decision theory, which can explain a whole bunch of anomalies at once mm -hmm. and longstanding anomalies. And I think that's a very, very powerful result in science, um, extremely powerful result, um, which I think social scientists need to pay attention to. And it provides the main motivation for going a quantum route, I think. Okay, so let me tell you the reaction I kind of had to this. I mean, first of all, I've, uh, you know, I wrote a book a long time ago about evolutionary psychology, and a certain amount of seeming human irrationality seems to have a plausible explanation in terms of evolutionary psychology. In right. fact, there's a well-known uh, evolutionary psychology psychologist, Lita Cosmetis, who took a lot of uh, Kahneman and Tversky findings and argued that um, actually, first of all, they, they, in a way their findings were misleading, that, that if some of these questions you framed in a different way, you presented the same logical mm -hmm. task in a way that would have been more like the form in which our ancestors during evolution would have encountered the problem, mm -hmm. you tended to see uh, less irrational results. But even beyond that, um, there is... Uh, you, there are evolutionary arguments for flat-out irrationality, flat-out, uh, you know, misperceptions of things that could have been adaptive for us to, yeah. for example, false positives, like the fact that we overestimate the speed with which uh, objects are approaching us, you know, better safe than sorry, better to get out of the way. So that's an example of an unclear perception that's favored by natural selection. So, and, you know, you you can certainly, so there are these plausible Darwinian stories for irrational results. And of course, the Darwinian story can be put in classical terms, right? You don't have to get quantum. So, and, and of course, you could also, I think you could, it's easy to imagine building an artificial brain, a computer that would events um, some of these answers and would be ultimately deterministic in the way it works and kind of classical in its functioning. Is that is this an, uh, uh, an objection you've encountered? It's not quite an objection. It's just an alternative way of explaining what you think is best explained via quantum coherence. Yeah, no, I've heard this. Um, I haven't heard it very often, and I haven't given it as much thought, I think, as it deserves. It's clearly an important um, line of skepticism. Um, I guess it doesn't strike me as especially elegant as a explanation. And what I like about the quantum decision theory explanation is that not only is it at a more fundamental level, because it's about the structure of the brain, but it's extremely elegant. Um, but the evolutionary arguments, yes, that's a more macro level argument. Um, it does not, though, as, as I understand what you're saying, and from what little I know, doesn't talk about consciousness. Oh, no, nobody yeah. has a clue about consciousness. Yeah, and I think consciousness has got to be in the picture 
we're going to build a model of human beings and a model of society that doesn't include consciousness, there's something wrong with the model, it seems to me. So. No, it doesn't purport to... Uh... Um, in fact, I mean, if anything, thinking in Darwinian terms underscores how clueless we are about <laughs> consciousness, just because if, if you think about natural selection starting with like the first bacterium and, you, you know, you understand it's something super simple where you understand how it works, builds a crude cell wall. You're looking at it. It's a machine that gets its, its material replicated. And then you imagine a bunch of mutations all the way up to human beings, there's no obvious reason right. for consciousness to ever show up because you actually can, in principle, explain the functioning of all the animals, including us, in physical terms. Yes, that's right. So, yeah. So, no, it's, it's, uh, that's definitely puzzling. Now, um, can I make one other suggestion along sure. these lines? It's just sure. a thought. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, with quantum game theory which hasn't yet been assimilated by social scientists, um, it too makes a lot of predictions about how people behave in strategic interaction situations. And my prediction is that all the findings that the experimental game theorists have found about how people deviate from rational behavior in prison dilemma and everything else, I'll bet all those findings also will be explained by quantum game theory. So mm -hmm. we'll see. But I think that's the next kind of move that somebody should start doing. Behavioral economics meets quantum game theory, basically. I'll bet there's a perfect match. That's a good, that will be an interesting case because there too, um, there are, you know, theories have been posited, explanations have been posited that are Darwinian. For example, you know, the ultimatum game. Mm -hmm. Is it the ultimatum game where people will seemingly irrationally turn down the, the ability to make lots of money because uh, in a kind of, uh, I mean, anyway, it's a case where pride would seem to play a role. There's some game where people seem to be irrational because they were so offended by the failure, by, by the offer. They're so insulted by the offer, right? That, that even though it's on the table and they can take it, it's like, you can take the $5, it's yours. They're like, no, I am, you know, I'm, so th that emotional reaction Evolutionary psychologists would say, make sense in the environment of our evolution. You have to demonstrate that you cannot be taken for granted for the purposes of continuing to interact fruitfully with these people. Uh, in other words, the games would have been iterated in, in real life, regardless of whether they are in the, in the experiment. But uh, anyway, so that'll be interesting. Do you want to say a little more about the nature of quantum, either game theory or decision theory? Is it that is it that they say, okay, at this point, you actually roll the dice to determine like what your play is or what you believe or something or what, what you say you believe is the case? Does, are, are these theories probabilistic in that way or, or, or is there more you can say? Um, well, they're, I guess I hesitate to say they're probabilistic in the way you just said. I mean, I, as I see it, the, the outcomes in both in decision theory, quantum decision theory, and quantum game theory, the outcomes are driven by purposive choices. So it's what people choose to do, that is, it's the free will thing coming in, that's what's gonna affect where the, the outcomes actually come out. Um, you know, quantum game theory is, is very interesting, it's very extremely mathematical and very hard to wrap your head around. Um, and you know how mixed strategies in classical game theory are not the same as entangled strategies in quantum game theory. And I just can't see through the details. Um, but they do make different predictions, um, especially in games like Persian's Dilemma. And we know from all the experimental research that people cooperate much more than they should in most situations of strategic interaction. So that's what a quantum game theory perspective would suggest. Okay. Um, now, do you want to... Uh... I'm sure some of your colleagues have, have uh, pressed you for the relationship between all this and international relations. Do you, uh, do, do you have an answer when they press you? Um, well, most of my colleagues are tolerant of, of me, uh, at least my colleagues here at Ohio State, um, so they don't press too hard. Um, you know, I think my answer would be that international relations is just one small little field in the entire domain of social life, human social life. I would say that all aspects of human social life operate in a quantum fashion. 
So there's nothing special about international relations, except that the actors we often assume are states rather than individuals, and that kind of creates some complications perhaps, but fundamentally, there's nothing special about international relations. What's special is quantum social science, and that's what we should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and when students contact me about this, and can I study this and all this, one of the things that I tell them and that's, that's, that's attractive about this approach is that it's a universal language across all social sciences and beyond. Everyone can talk the same language and we don't have to worry about are you a sociologist or an economist or a political scientist? It doesn't matter anymore or not as much anymore as it used to. Of course, that was, isn't that kind of what some people used to say about the classical view of the world? In other words, some parts of social science were, were modeled almost after yes. a, a kind of a Newtonian world. Right. Where, where, and, and that kind of regularity was assumed and so on. Yes, I mean, I think in the 19th century, there was very conscious modeling of social science on the classical worldview, and that was a gigantic type two error, basically. Um, and now we've all been socialized into believing this, and the paper I'm working on actually right now is exploring the consequences of three centuries of classical pedagogy on the human mind, mm -hmm. and how it's actually created more stunted, repressed creatures than we would be if we thought of ourselves in quantum terms, where we hmm. have freedom and everything else. So I want to, I think actually this mistake that was made in, in, in treating human beings in classical terms actually is pernicious socially in the real world because it has affected human subjectivity in negative ways. So is, is part of the appeal to you that you think it's more productive to think of us as having agency? In other words, you, uh, for example, do you think that a kind of an implicitly deterministic conception of human social reality actually keeps us from creating a better world? Yeah, I think um, it's partly the, the, the deterministic part, and it's also the entanglement issue, that the standard classical picture of human beings is completely individualistic, we're all separate and completely separable individuals. And that really sets you up then for kind of a Hobbesian state of nature and that um, starting, that's that, that okay. being your starting point. And so conflict is the default situation. And in the quantum world, I would say cooperation is perhaps more the default. Um, so it kind of flips the, what we would, our basic expectations about how social life should evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I got to say, every once in a while, like I'm looking into my dog's eyes, you know, and I feel such affection for my dog. And I kind of do the thought experiment, like suppose, I mean, of course, we have this materialistic explanation of why I could have come to like a dog, just as we do with like, you know, Darwinians do with why you come to love your offspring and so on. And you can describe it in a completely mechanistic way. But sometimes I do wonder, like, what if I've almost got it backwards and the you know, the causal stuff is almost at the level of consciousness. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That actually makes sense to you. I would call that a warning sign if that makes sense to you, but you're saying it does. Well, um, I guess maybe I misunderstood what you just said, but um, it is true that we can describe the dog's behavior mechanically. Um, we can describe human behavior mechanically. Um, that leaves out the most important part about being a human or probably being a dog, which is you can experience being a human or right. being a dog. Right. Uh, and I just think any theory that leaves that out is must be wrong at some level or oh. it has a gigantic hole in the theory. Certainly incomplete. Yeah. Incomplete. I mean, I guess I'm kind of thinking, you know, as you know, there have long been these kind of Eastern philosophies. Um, I don't know how they put it, the ontological primacy of mind or something, you know, the basic idea. And you see these in, certain variants of Western philosophy where, you know, kind of Barclay's idealism or something where, and, and I guess that's the inversion I'm, ima you know, where, where in other words, consciousness or mind is actually, you know, we naturally think of the physical stuff as creating the consciousness. In, in these views, it's closer to being reversed. And that's what I'm kind of, I, I don't, I generally have trouble imagining that. I'm just saying sometimes when I look in my dog's eyes, I can kind of imagine it being true. If that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. And okay. I think I understand better now. I guess I would say rather than reversing the, the direction of the causation, so to speak, it's more that um, consciousness is co-emergent with the material stuff that we see and, and can kind of right. touch and all that. Um, but they're both welling up from the quantum level 
um, and scaled up through the human organism and through quantum coherence, and then they kind of come out in our behavior, but the consciousness and the behavior come out at the same time, so to speak. So would you say that your view is not that mind is ontologically primary, just that it's kind of co-equal with the material world? Yeah, I mean, the phrase that, I mean, neutral monism is a, you know, a doctrine that a lot of people are talking about now, and dual aspect monism, and which is pretty close to the same thing. And so I'm a, I'm a monist, and I want to, I'm attracted to a framework that is monistic, but then it needs to explain then the separation of consciousness from the physical world. And so you get some kind of a symmetry breaking there, and the quantum perspective allows for that. Um, so um, I don't want to say it's primary. Um, I want what I want is something that's neither mind nor matter, but can explain the emergence of the distinction. And that's what some of the quantum people that I draw on make that kind of argument. When you said it's neither mind or matter, what is the referent of the pronoun it? Uh, it's um, it's this neutral monistic. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's at the bottom of reality. Yeah. You know, some people say it's the quantum vacuum or the quantum, um, yeah. you know, the zero point field or whatever it is. Um, but that somehow all life forms are tapped into this fundamental re level of reality and then just scale it up in their through their bodies, so to speak, channeling okay. them. Okay. Do you, do you want to say a little bit more about the word monism? So it's a it's a word associated with Leibniz, I gather, and you're. You're kind of a Leibniz fan, is that right? As much as I know about Leibniz as a failed philosopher, yes. Well, um, you know more than I do, so do you want to want to define monism for us? Well, monism would be a doctrine that says that that um, the ontology of the world is, well, I mean, I guess, a, a, well, actually, a materialist is also a monist, a hardcore materialist who would say that consciousness is an illusion. That would be a kind of monism. But if you accept that consciousness is real, um, then you get end up with a dualism as kind of the standard, you know, materialist view of the body, and then you've got consciousness sitting over here. And a monist wants to say that that uh, at the fundamental level, uh, reality is neither mental nor physical. Um, but that the what's interesting is that the constant emergence of the distinction between the two, and that's all associated with the collapse of the wave function. And so. It comes down to um, that level of kind of elementary processes, um, but that everything at some basic level is the same. So consciousness and matter are neither, e neither is either. Um, they're just proto-consciousness, proto-matter or something So like monism that. is just the assertion of a fundamental unity? I mean, generic yes. monism, that's what that's, it is. That's a much simpler, yeah, much more straightforward, yeah. And uh, so as long as we're talking again about the wave function. I'm not sure I totally pinned you down. There, there, there are these, you know, these two interpretations of the idea that measurement forces the electron to assume definite form. One is that it, the only thing about the measurement that was important was the physical interaction with the measuring device, and it, it didn't even have to be a measuring device per se. It's just all about physical interaction. But the other one is that, no, it's the conscious observation of it by the observer. Do, do, you, do you take sides on that? Question. Yes. yes, that would be the latter. The latter view would be mine. Although I don't want to say that the consciousness of the observer uh, creates the collapse. And I think that's, you know, some quantum consciousness people take that route. Um, I don't want to say that. I want to say that um, following others, that the conscious ob observation of the, of the, or the conscious measurement of the, of the particle. Um, well, the, the particle showing up in a certain place is associated with a certain conscious state. Um, but that doesn't mean that the conscious state created the collapse or caused the collapse. Uh, it's and partly because I think the particles themselves are making their own choices. Um, you know, we tend to view particle behavior as random, but it's only random when viewed from the outside. If you think of particles as having an inside, like we do, then you can imagine their behavior as purposive. Um, and so I would want to say purposiveness goes all the way down just like mine does. Right. Um, so that, which brings us back to panpsychism. So, um, the, uh, so let's talk, you mentioned language. Maybe we should quickly return to kind of a social manifestation of this. And you, you said that you talked about human minds being entangled 
uh, and then you said through language, but I, my my reaction would be that couldn't be true entanglement, right? I mean, like true amazing quantum entanglement happens instantaneous, whereas anything that is uh, conveyed via language is limited in its velocity by the speed of light. It can't be faster than that, right? And I mean, not to mention the fact that just, you know, coordination and so on and via language is understandable in classical terms in principle, right? It's, it doesn't seem so magical because you, I mean, it does and it doesn't. When you're on one end of it, you're having conscious experience, but you could also just describe the physical manifestation, right? I send the photons, they hit your brain. Uh, but in any event, I guess that my main point is language can't move faster than the speed of light. Right. Because quantum entanglement can, and yet you seem to be equating entanglement with uh, uh, relationships between people that are mediated by language. No, that's a good question. And the whole issue of language being a mediating uh, device is a complication. And I haven't thought this through, but I, I would say that um, actually – in social life through language, stuff happens instantaneously all the time. And the example I use in the book, which is a famous example, you know, when Socrates drinks the hemlock, his wife's Antipi instantaneously becomes a widow, no matter how far away she is. Now, of course, the skeptic will say, well, that's because we define widow and wives a certain way and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, those definitions, if they're socially shared, I would say are entangled. And so it allows us to say, meaningfully that when Socrates dies, instantly Xantippe is a widow. Or in a, in a case of a, uh, a monarchy, the king dies, instantly the son or daughter is now the king or queen, instantly. And, and that's not a causal process, that's just by definition. So a lot of language is really about definitions and creating meaning, and the meanings come from the definition. And so um, I think there are pervasive um, or, for example, if, if the president declares war, um, you know, that single choice, instantaneously, millions of people's futures are now different than they would have been right. if he or she had not declared war, instantaneously. Although they can't start acting like that instantaneously, right? I mean, they can't start complying with the definition of a conscripted soldier or of Socrates, uh, or being a widow in the case of Socrates' wife until the information has actually reached them, right? That's right. That's right. So there has to be some kind of classical transfer of information. Um, but I, my understanding is that this also is true in the quantum world, but I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, but you're right. If they don't know about it, then they can't act on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I guess the other way, the other example that I think is compelling is, you know, Hegel's analysis of the master-slave relation Um it's, it's inconceivable to have a master without a slave and vice versa. So I would say that's a case of entanglement. And the properties of the master depend in a constitutional way, not a causal way, but in a constitutional way, on the properties of the slave and vice versa. So, again, that seems to be an, instanta and so an instantaneous kind of connection, a non-local connection, that is hard to make sense of in a straight materialist sense, mm -hmm. where the master is a a master on his own and the slave is a slave on his own. And then they somehow come together and interact, which is the standard picture. That just strikes me as implausible. You're a master and a slave together and to, you stay that way together. And all your actions are actions in an entangled pair. And so the behavior of one is correlated with the behavior of the other and vice versa. But you're right. There has to be knowledge. And I don't know how to quite figure out where the knowledge part fits in. Okay. There's also an example you use about the state, like what is a state? The idea being that an alien, I guess it is famously said, apparently, I didn't know this, but that an alien looking um, down on planet Earth would not be able to discern a state. Right. Um, I mean, I guess an alien might be able to spot correlations of behavior among citizens in a state, but maybe that's not the same as discerning a state anyway. But anyway, you see this stuff is having relevance to that particular thought experiment? Yes, and, and partly because as an IR person, states are, you know, my, my whole first book is about states since I've been interested in states for a long time and, and also just other kinds of collective or corporate agency. Um, and, you know, the argument in the book is that, you know, aliens won't see states. Their states are invisible. 
Um, so the only way you can know a state is there is if you already know it's there. If you believe it's there, then you'll see it. But if you don't believe it, you won't see it. Or if you don't know it's there, you won't see it. And I would say that classical phenomena are not like that. Classical phenomena, you can see them. Even if you need a magnifying glass or a telescope, you can see them. But a state is in principle not viewable except when the soldier fires his gun or the immigration officer you know, takes away the passport of the illegal immigrant or whatever it is. That's where the state appears. And so the state is constantly popping in and out of existence wherever its agents are acting on its behalf. Um, and all those actions are entangled with the larger entity that we call the U.S. state, for example. Okay. Now, um, do you want to talk, uh, speaking of your first book, um, so I gather, um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't read it, but I gather that it is an example of applying what's called social constructivism to international relations. Yes. And I think you, as much as any other single person, are associated with that whole move of, of applying social constructivism to international relations. Um, I want to ask if all this quantum stuff has anything to do with that. But before you answer that, can you want to just talk a little about what social constructivism is, how your view of international relations uh, as expressed in that earlier book differs from the main schools of thought? Yeah, I mean, the the book was written targeting kind of a materialist picture, the so-called realist picture of world politics, which has been the dominant view for a long time in IR. And not all realists are believe this, but I think most realists are materialists and it's all, everything, world politics is all about power and interest and force and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they don't, most realists don't take ideas very seriously. They don't take institutions seriously. Um, they don't take consciousness seriously. And um, so the book was in social construction in general. Um, and it's not just me. I mean, it was actually, there are a lot of post-structuralists and others who have also contributed and their views are different than mine in important ways. Um, but all social constructivists, I'd say, would agree that um, it's not the material stuff per se that matters. It's the meanings that are attached to it. And so the example that I've used and has gotten a lot of play is that the United States is much more afraid of five North Korean nuclear weapons than we are of 500 British ones, right? So it can't be the material stuff alone that generates the meaning. What generates the meaning is that we're friends with the Brits and we're enemies with the North Koreans. That's what matters. And that's a social relationship that's mediated by language and ideas. Mm -hmm. so in, other words, it, in other words, it's ultimately a function of whether we think of them as friends or enemies. Right. Absolutely. And it may not even be objectively um, defensible, the, the right. claim that we are. Right. That's correct. And that's, yeah. So, so there you're partly, I mean, it's true that realists, we, we don't, don't have time to get into what exactly realists are, but one thing they do seem to assume is that uh, states are, are very, well, states are very rational in, in the way that they're rationally self-interested uh, beings and, and their behavior is predictable for that reason, and and so you're 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 taking issue with that. You're 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 not alone in you're uh, in taking issue, but you're taking issue for a distinctive set of reasons, and that's what that had to do with social constructivism. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I would add to that is that one way to think about the difference with the realists and the constructivists is that realists have kind of an economic way of thinking about the world, very individualistic, rational, self-interest, blah blah blah. And constructivists, I think, have a more sociological or anthropological view of the world. It's more holistic, it's collective, um, language and discourse are really important and so on. So it's partly a disciplinary difference, or, mm -hmm. but, but I think it's really a more fundamental philosophical difference. And do you see that as very much connected with the, the – do you see your position on this issue as very much connected with your position on these quantum issues? I do, although one of the main lines of skepticism I get from my IR colleagues, especially the ones who are already constructivists, is we're already constructivists, so what do we need this fancy quantum argument for? It doesn't tell us anything we don't already know. Right. Um, and so I've had to think about that. That's a tough question. You know, what is the value added here, bringing in the physics? Because a lot of startup costs and learning it, it's very hard and, you know, difficult to make sense of. And um, and partly my argument, my response is that the, if you want a foundation 
for these constructivist arguments a philosophical foundation, it's going to have to be quantum rather than classical. Um, and secondly, if you want to move these constructivist arguments from the fringes of the field into the mainstream, you're going to want a quantum foundation there too. Um, so the one thing that I, the real value added, I think, of the quantum perspective for constructivist style IR is that it can potentially make constructivism the mainstream view. Um, although that's kind of not really an intellectual reason, that's more of a political reason. But, um, but yes, I do see them as connected. Um, and, but, you know, I'm not saying that all IR scholars need to go read quantum theory. Um, they can keep doing what they're doing. But if you want to understand what they're really saying and what language really is and how it, how it works in social life and how choices work and so on, all that is going to require a quantum apparatus to make sense of it because it won't make sense from a classical perspective. But some of your constructivist colleagues reply, actually, yes, we can think of language in classical terms and account for its effects uh, without you um, giving us a reputation for being more cosmic than is uh, tactically optimal at this point in our careers. Yes, that's right. And actually, many people, I think, and this is even true among the quantum decision theorists, they're extremely cautious. They don't bring in consciousness. They don't want anything to do with quantum consciousness. They're these, they are very hardcore scientists. And um, so, yeah, it's, a lot of people are willing to go a certain distance, but then the rest of it, they think, well, I don't need the rest. It's too speculative. And so, mm -hmm. and I, I understand that. And, you know, in the end, I can't claim that my view is true. What do I know? Nobody knows if this is true or not. But I figured I would just lay it all out in just one, you know, chain of reasoning and then see what people make of it. Yeah. I mean, it is odd. I mean, I mean, there is on the one hand the kind of assumption, which I intuitively kind of share, that you can describe things either what you can describe the subjective experience of language, how, what it feels like to think up a thought and experience a communication from someone, or you can just forego all that. Uh, at least in principle, it seems like you could forego all that and describe it all at the physical level, like I said something, the sound waves entered the person's brain. There are these algorithms in the brain for processing the physical sound waves and an utterance came out and replied. In principle, that seems to make sense. And yet you do kind of suspect that maybe that's a little too simple. And if it is the case, then why is there consciousness to begin with? Yeah, and I guess to that, I would just add that um, even in mainstream philosophy of language and mainstream philosophy of mind, you have a lot of people who would say that meaning is not in the head. Meaning is somehow in between people. But what can that mean physically? It has to be physical because everything's physical one way or the other, quantum or classical. And so I, I would sort of push back against people who would say that, that language and meaning especially can be understood mechanically. Uh, I just think that's counterintuitive, um, but that argument is out there, obviously, and, and hasn't been defeated by any means. Will um, will artificial intelligence, to some extent, be a test of your worldview? In other words, I gather computers are these things that, yes, at some level, they're quantum things. I mean, they're dealing with electrons, after all, and there are quantum effects. But the idea of a computer is it's designed to to subordinate the significance of, of that to nothingness because the computer itself is a deterministic machine. So there's not weird quantum stuff bubbling up. Right. And in other words, the computers are designed to decohere. And, right. and so if it turns out that AI can do anything humans can, would that make you rethink your view? Well, if AI can create conscious computers, that would, um, a classical AI, yeah. If classical AI can create conscious computers, then that would force me to rethink my view. In fact, I would say that we are, I, mean, I used to say we're walking wave functions. I think it's actually maybe more accurate to say we're walking quantum computers. Um, so I think we are actually quantum computers in, in essence. Um, and so AI, it'll, as long as it remains classical, I would say it's a dead end project. It'll do lots of good, good stuff and do important work and everything, but it won't solve the fundamental problems. You would really need to go to a quantum AI, quantum computation. Um, and so when I look at people trying to build quantum computers, and now we have very simple ones now, uh, you know, a few qubits, I don't know what the latest number is. To me, the people who are building quantum computers, they're actually creating life, artificial life. 
Um, they just don't real they don't think of it that way. But I would say that's what a quantum computer is: is artificial life. Mm -hmm. And a walking quantum computer like us is not even artificial. It's just that's what just life is. Right. As a panpsychist, I would think you'd think that there's some degree of subjective something or other in a classical computer, but nothing like there would be in a quantum computer of similar complexity. Is that it? Well, I would say that in the classical computer, there's some aspect of subjectivity in each of the different particles that make it up, but not in the whole. Right. I know some panpsychists would say, well, uh, the whole computer has some kind of subjectivity or consciousness. I guess that to me doesn't seem right. So it's just the parts. But because the parts are not quantum coherent, their subjectivity kind of dissipates at the particle level. And so it washes out. So it's not a collective consciousness. Right. A, a classical computer doesn't have collective unified consciousness the way right. we do. Right. Well, then I guess here's a cosmic question to end on. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, you, uh, well, first of all, I know you've written a thing about the evolution of world government as a, a very plausible, likely outcome or, or, or uh, maybe necessary outcome. Um, and, you know, some of your thinking, when you talk about uh, matter having a kind of interiority to it, it reminds me of this uh, philosopher, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, this theologian, oh, yeah. you know him, the idea that uh, humankind is being woven together by technology in such a way that we constitute kind of a giant global brain with this thing that's a noosphere. So uh, in your view, is it possible that someday consciousness and i guess we can't rule out the possibility that it already is i don't know how we know but the consciousness could be collective at the level of species or the level of planet or um that's a good question i think if it were coherent then i would have to quantum coherent then i would have to say yes um at the same time it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be that collective consciousness um which you know, so I'm not quite sure how to think about this. I mean, actually, yeah. one line of argument that I'm intrigued by is that actually the ultimate unit of consciousness is the cell. And even in the human body, what you really have are billions and billions of separate consciousnesses in the human body. Right. Which somehow uh, cohere into the experience of a unified consciousness. But actually, it's really cell consciousness is a whole bunch of entangled cell consciousnesses. Right. By analogy, that might work then between humans collectively right. in society. And so it I'm could be that. It, I'm sorry, go ahead. It could be that even within my body, it is still like something to be an individual cell. Yeah. And that's what I meant when I said that even though it's like something to be me, I can't be sure it's not like something to be the whole species or to be a whole corporation or to be any kind of cohesive team. Yes, that's right. But I think that that's the whole collective consciousness issue, I think, is a very intriguing one and what that could possibly mean, how this relates to sort of parapsychological phenomena, you know, which I think is a, another direction one can go with these arguments. I'm not sure how to think about that. Um, but I mean, I, for me, politically, part of the attraction of this argument overall for social science and social life and politics is that it, first of all, it empowers human beings to think of themselves as much more capable than we would think of ourselves if we're classical. And it helps us think of our consciousness in more collective terms. Um, and we need a lot of that if we're gonna solve climate change and everything else. I mean, we need as much cooperation as we can possibly get. This ontology will, if it becomes socialized into us, I think will help us realize our actual true quantum potential, which is being repressed now by an artificial mistaken classical worldview that's been kind of stamped on top of us. So you think actually thinking of the world this way is liberating? Yes, yes. Empowering? Yes, yeah, that's the intuition. And politically then down the road would make us more capable of solving problems collectively on a global scale. Okay, well, it's obvious what your next book should be. It should be a self-help book then. <laughs> <laughs> Un unleash your quantum self that's i hadn't thought of that but that's good okay I'll, I'll make a note of that yeah okay well i'll let you get busy on that then um and uh thank you for taking the time i mean i feel we could have another conversation on uh well possibly even a whole nother set of topics like like global governance or something but for now you've given us plenty to think about and uh, well i do want to i do want to ask quickly so what are you working on now are you working on a next project 
I'm working on some, um, probably what I'm doing is responding to critics of the quantum book that have been reviews and there's some right. symposia and stuff like that. I'm writing this paper about the consequences of thinking in classical versus quantum terms for society. Um, beyond that, you know, I want to return to the world state story. And my original idea was to quantize the world state argument. I'm not sure how to do that yet, but I think that's a natural direction to go and brings me back into IR so that my colleagues might be happy about that. Um, but right now I'm kind of not putting too many constraints on me myself and um, just taking it one step at a time and see what kind of feedback I get. The other thing I'm trying to do though is institutional, which is to create institutionally a quantum social science. And that's not just me, obviously a lot of people are needed for that, but that means creating grad students, it means getting creating pipeline, it means creating programs or, or degrees of some kind where this kind of work can be done. I'm trying to do that at Ohio State in the beginning kind of way. Um, so I want to sort of, there's a lot of institutional work that needs to be done to get this stuff off the ground and teaching people the math. No one knows the math in social science. Yeah got to train the people to learn the math and so on. So um, there's a lot of work to do on that side, which isn't intellectual at all, but I'm interested in doing my part to kind of move the ball forward there. Okay. So you are committed. Yeah, I'm a true believer. I mean, I'm a true, and I may as well be at this point. I spent 10 years writing yeah. the damn thing. So, you know. In for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah, I would say, I would say yeah. stick with it. Yeah, that's my, that's my advice. Aside from writing the self-help book, that's my only other piece of advice. Okay. Stay in the well, quantum world. I really appreciate you having me on the show. It's a great opportunity to be able to talk with a non-skeptic or at least, you know, someone who's asking tough questions, but not in a hostile way. And, um, and they just try to articulate the argument for a larger audience. It's just, I'm really, I really appreciate it. Well, okay. it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad you could take the time. I think the reality is definitely weird enough for, to accommodate the possibility that you're right about this. <laughs> Yeah, actually, my concluding thought would be, I think human beings know much less than we think we do about reality and the world across the board. Um, oh, this, totally. Yeah. So this is just one area where I think, you know, a lot more could be true than we really have any idea right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Good luck with the, with the quantum revolution. All right. Well, thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Okay. See you later. Take care.